This is section 5.3, part D, independence, a special multiplication rule. If events A and B are independent events, then the probability of event A and B both occurring, or the probability of A and B, is the probability of A times the probability of B. Remember, we know that two events are independent if the probability of event A, given that event B has already happened, is equal to the probability of A, and if the probability of event B, given that probability event A has already happened, is just equal to the probability of event B. This rule only applies to independent events. On January 28, 1986, Space Shuttle Challenger exploded on takeoff. All seven crew members were killed. Following this disaster, scientists and statisticians helped analyze what went wrong. They determined that the failure of O-ring joints in the shuttle's booster rockets were to blame. Under the cold conditions that day, experts estimated that the probability that an individual O-ring joint would function properly was 0.977, but that there were six rings of these O-ring joints, and all six had to function properly for the shuttle to launch safely. Assuming that the O-ring joints succeed or fail independently, find the probability that the shuttle would launch safely under similar conditions. So we have the probability that joint one is okay and the probability that joint two is okay, three, four, five, and six. So the probability of event one is 0 0.977 times the probability of event two, which is 0 0.977, so on and so forth for all six joints. So the probability that all six would work properly at the same time is actually 87%. So there's an 87% chance that the shuttle would launch safely under similar, condition, under similar conditions. But this also means there's a 13% chance that they do not all work properly. It should be noted that as a result of this statistical analysis following the Challenger disaster, NASA made important safety changes to the design of their shuttle's booster rockets. Many people who come to clinics to be tested for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, doesn't come, don't come back to learn their test results. Clinics now use rapid HVE test to give a result while the client is still waiting. In a clinic for example, that uses rapid test increases the percent of clients who learn their test results from 69% to 99.7%. The trade-off for this fast result is that rapid tests are less accurate than slower laboratory tests. Applied to people who have no HIV antibodies, one rapid test has the probability of about 0 0.004 of producing a false positive. So this means that it indicates that a person has HIV when they actually do not. So we need to do a four-step problem. Remember, on a four-step problem, we first have to state what we're trying to solve. So based off this information, it may be important to know if a clinic tests 200 people who are free of HIV antibodies, what is the chance that at least one false positive will occur? Next, we need to come up with our plan. So it's reasonable to assume that the test results for different individuals are independent. We have 200 independent events, each with a probability of 0 0.004. So the probability that at least one combines many possible outcomes. It would be easier to find the probability of at least one to be one minus the probability that none of them are positive. So to do this, first we need to find the probability that no people out of those 200 are positive. To get the probability of no positives out of 200, we would have to multiply 0.966 together 200 times, or we can do 0.96996 raised to the 200 power. This indicates that we're going to multiply it together 200 times. And this gives us a probability that out of those 200 people, none of them get a negative, a positive test result when the person is actually negative, so a false positive, would be 0.4486. 
So the probability that at least one person gets a false positive would be one minus that 0.4486, which means there is a 55% chance. So our conclusion is that the probability of at least one person out of the 200 people that are tested who will get an HIV false positive, which means they are HIV negative, but they still test positive, is 55%. We have a caution. The multiplication rule of probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B holds if A and B are independent, but not otherwise. The addition rule of probability of A and B, which equals the probability of A plus the probability of B, holds if A and B are mutually exclusive, but not otherwise. Resist the temptation to use these simple rules when the conditions that justify them are not present. So two mutually exclusive events can never be independent because one event happens, the other event is guaranteed not to happen. So let's check our understanding. During World War II, the British found that the probability of a bomber is lost through enemy action on a mission over occupied Europe was 0.05. Assuming that missions are independent, find the probability that a bomber returns safely from 20 missions. So the probability they return safely from one mission is 0 0.95 because if the probability they will not return is 0 0.5, we can do one minus that probability. Now the probability to return over all 20 missions would be 0 0.95 to the 20th power, which would give us 0 0.3585. So there's about a 36% chance that one of these pilots will return safely after all 20 missions. Government data shows that 8% of adults are full-time college students and 30% of adults are age 55 or older. Since 0 0.08 times 0 0.30 is equal to 0 0.024, can we conclude that about 2.4% of adults are in college are students who are 55 or older. Why or why not? We cannot make this conclusion whether one person is a college student and one's age are not independent. Far more younger people than older people are actually in college. So these events are not independent. So we cannot just multiply the two values together.